Hello and welcome to Dungeon. I'm Bill and this is a series where we're documenting and demonstrating the process of making a game from scratch. Today is day 18 and in the previous day I did a brief introduction to complex numbers and how we can use them to do rotations in two-dimensional space. In today's video I'm going to be talking about quaternions and how they are analogous to complex numbers but for rotations in three-dimensional space. Um, as I'll say again, please watch the previous video, but if you want to, kind of, I'll give a brief introduction anyway. So in computer graphics, we use transformations to express how to move a point or um, a vector or something in space. So we have translation, which will move it around. We have rotations, which will change the orientation in space. And then we'll have like a scale or a shear of an object, which will change how big it is or sheared it is or whatever. And we usually represent these as matrices. And that's what we've been doing before in the previous episodes. We've been using matrices to represent the translation, the rotations, and the scales. So you can think of this transformation matrix as, a, as something called basis space. Now, this means what we do is you, when you multiply it to a vector or a point or whatever, or another matrix, you transform that thing that vector point matrix, something else, I don't know, into space that is represented into that matrix. It's, rep it's been transformed into that basis space. And so in today's episode, we're going to be talking about why we're going to use quaternions um, rather than um, Euler angles or matrices or some other, or why not to use them as well. Um, so back in the 1800s, there was this chap called, um, uh, oops, uh, oops, why is it not brushed, there we go. So there was this chap called Hamilton, so he was Sir William Hamilton. Hamilton. And let's get it to about point four. Yeah, that's better, yeah. Mm, oops, what, get the, trying to use this properly, yeah. There we go. And in the, how was it, the 18, it was in 1843, he was uh, on his way to the Irish Academy with his wife, and he was just uh, going down, uh, I was just walking down, he was trying to get to the Irish Academy, and all of a sudden, he thought of something, and it made him realise that he, that he immediately, this is apparently the story, immediately wrote it into the bridge that he was walking under in the stone with his knife or something and actually wrote this i squared times j squared it was k squared it was i j k now i don't know how he came up with this or why he came up with this um he just did and it was okay i've just thought this up and it seems interesting and again i've got a picture here of um, wikipedia and this is actually um, public domain, so it's absolutely fine. Um, and this is actually a, a plaque, actually on that bridge. And it says, he uh, here as he walked by on the 16th of October, 1843, Sir William Rowan Hamilton, it's a bit disintegrated here, in a flash of genius, discovered the fundamental formula for quaternion multiplication. I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals IJK equals negative 1. And then I... And this is just, I can't, and, it, and then something, something on stone on the bridge. And then carved in, or carved in, carved in the stone on, carved on a stone in the bridge or whatever. I can't read it, to be honest with you. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's what he discovered. And I, in today's episode, I'm going to explain what this means and why. So again, in the previous episode, I explained that we have different sets of numbers. We have um, real, naturals, uh, integers, Rationals, please watch that previous episode. It'll make much more sense. I'm just going to go cover over some other stuff. And as we talked about before, we had this imaginary unit called I. So uh, I, what we said it was I squared equals negative one. Now quaternions, again, as I, I was been explaining again, we can think we can extend this to three dimensions. So what we do is we had two more imaginary numbers. We had j squared and k squared. So these both equal negative one. So we had i, j, and k. Yeah, it makes sense. So the general form for a quaternion, 
as we write it normally. So Q, I'm going to write as quaternion, is like W plus XI plus YJ plus K, sorry, ZK. And this is the way, um, so also W, X, Y, and Z are all real numbers. Yeah, just as then with complex numbers. Again, if you don't know this notation, please check the previous videos. But this means that our bold face is a real number, and this lunar means it's a set of. Yeah, it's in the set of the real numbers. So that's how we express an a quaternion. And again, according to Hamilton and his brightness of spark of genius, he said i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals i j k equals negative 1. And he said that. So as you notice, yeah, i squared plus j squared plus k squared all equal negative 1. They're all new imaginary numbers. But then he also said i j k equals negative 1. Well, you may think, OK, so i j must equal k in that case, yeah? And then we also, from that, we also get j, k must equal i. And then it starts to get a little bit more confusing. So what other weight combinations could we do? Well, the next one is actually k, i equals j. This is because quaternions are anti-commutative. Their order actually matters. So if I wrote this in the backwards order, i, j equals negative k, k, j equals negative i, and i, k equals negative j. So these are in the negative orders. And again, you may be thinking, what else? What other thing in three dimensions has this certain property where if you do it in the opposite order, it flips it? And this, again, you may have thought it, it's the cross product. Now, in vectors for cross products, they do the exact same thing. So if you add x, um, so I'm just do x cross product with y, what you get is z. When you do y cross z, you get x. And, oops, sorry, equals x. And then what you get is z cross x, you get y, and you get the same thing again if you do it in the opposite order. z times y equals negative x, and x cross z equals negative y. So the, um, these imaginary, new imaginary units are akin to these cross products. And again, ha Hamilton recognised this, and this is why he's using i, j, and k to represent his um, imaginary numbers, because they're kind of like the unit vectors. Usually, what we write is for the unit vector of in the uh, x direction is i hat, j hat, and k hat, and they're usually the unit vectors for x, y, and z. So they're all length one in that direction. So that's where he got his realization from. So again, what I'm going to do is if I go down, if I draw some diagrams, if we had um, just go back to the straight line here. So we've got a straight line here, here, and here. I'm going to stick with the conventions that we've been using. So this would be x, that's y, and that's z. So right hand rule, right hand coordinates. So this comes, z comes out the screen, y goes up, and x goes to the right. So if we said this is also in the i direction, that's in the j direction, and that's in the k direction. That means to get from i to j, going that way, I'm going to do this in purple, just to make it a bit clearer. What we're doing is i, um, to get from i to j, what we're doing is doing um, k cross product with i. To get from that way, what we're doing is to get to k, we're going to do is i cross j, and to get that way, we need to do is, uh, what's the last one, j cross k. Yeah, that's what we're doing, to get different angles. And to go the backwards way, I'm going to do it in blue this time. To go that way, what we need to do is j cross i, or j times i in this case, doesn't really matter. k, um, i times k, i cross a, and that way yeah. is k cross j. So that's what we've been doing with the things. And that's a nice way to imagine these um, rotate, well, these, these quaternion um, units for imaginary numbers. And again, you may be thinking, where do I put the this W value, this just real value in here? Well, don't try and do that. Well, you can, but trying to imagine it, it's a bit difficult and it hurts your head.
but just imagining that it as different is easy. And the reason why, because usually, and we will be implementing it this way, is we represent a quaternion can be represented as something called an ordered pair. So what we do is represent it as a scalar value and a vector value. Yeah, that's an ordered pair. So where the scalar value is just a real number, which is W in this case, and the vector is actually a, a part of, again, it's a, in vector space, it's three-dimensional real space. Yeah? So again, this just means we're going to have, this is the same as me writing as W, Xi plus Yi, uh, not y, 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 I, I'm Geordie, sorry, <laughs> uh, ZK, I didn't mean to offend any people from um, from where Geordie accents come from, sorry about that, just there. So again, this is the same thing, where I, J and K would be the unit vectors for the vectors, I'll put them as vectors there. Makes sense? So this is actually makes it more easy to understand the relationship between quaternions and complex numbers. Um, when we implement this, we're going to put it the opposite way around. So it'll be x, y, z, w, rather than w, x, y, and z. Um, I'll explain that when we get to it. But for now, I'm going to be using s as the scalar and v as the vector, just to be a bit clearer. Again, I'm trying to maybe a bit too confusing here. Again, it's a very difficult thing to explain. Um, but I'm just trying to uh, keep it consistent so we know which one's the scalar and we know which one's the vector. Yeah? So as you can uh, guess... Addition subtraction works exactly the same as complex numbers. So if we had QA, which which we're going to say as um, equal to S A V A, and uh, QB, it's the same as S B V B. Addition of these is is as you expect. It would be S A plus S B plus V A plus V B, like so. And, that, and a subtraction would work exactly the same. S A minus S B, V A minus V B. Yeah? Now products become a little bit weirder. As we have learnt, the Order of the order of the multiplications matter, and i times j does not equal j times i, as we have learned that, etc. etc. Et so um, it can do it in multiplication. So what we're going to do is um, quaternion multiplication multiplication multiplication. That's how you spell it. Yeah, just check. <laughs> like so. So if we were doing, again, keeping the QAs and stuff, so QA times QB would be the same as me writing SAVA. I'm just going to scrap the underscore just because I'm just a bit lazy. SB, um, VB. Yeah. So we're going to expand out the brackets, but we've got to be careful about the way we do it. So we're going to do SA. We're going to expand it out to make it even easier to write. So what I'm going to do is write it as um, keep it as S instead of W this time. So we're going to do S A plus um, S A plus uh, X A I plus Y A J plus Z A K. And um, the reason why I'm going to do this is to ex do it the long way around. It's going to take a while to expand. Because it, you can't actually multiply two cross uh, two vectors together easily. I'll explain in a minute how you actually do that, and the shorthand for that is. But I'm going to do the longhand, and then I'm going to do the shorthand version. So let's do that's y b j plus z b k. Now, if we multiply these out, keeping the orders the same, what we're getting is s a times s b. Got to remember the order get counts. So we do it the same way out. And the next bit, we're going to multiply that, that by that, so we get is xa times xb. We're going to do the j bits, so it'll be minus ya, yb. And then the z bits, so za, zb. So that's our real part first. Yeah? So this is actually the, the real part there. So next we're going to do the um, start from x, and then we're going to do the imaginary parts, okay? So do S times XA. So S times 
maybe x uh, b. So this is all the imaginary parts. I'm just going to do that on the outside, yeah? The I parts, I should say. Next, what we've got to do is that times um, what else makes I? So, thinking about it, we've got SB times XI, yeah? But we've got to do it the opposite way around because it won't make any sense, just, just to keep it that way. So, I'm going to say that's plus XA SB, and again, we're doing it that way around. The next thing is um, we're going to do is J times K, which will give us I, so that'll be um, YA ZB. And then the last one will be the other way around, which will be uh, ZA times uh, YB, which will be negative ZA YB. So that's the I bit, and then I'm going to do for the J bit and so much. You can see where the pattern comes, so I'm just going to write it out again. That's SA uh, YB plus um, uh, where, whoops, how do I do that? How do I do S A performs by B times Y A times S B plus Z A uh, X B uh, minus Z B X A, and that's the J component. And then we've got the K component less, which would be S A Z B plus Z A S B plus x a um, y b minus um, uh, minus uh, x no x b y a and that's k and again this means this multiplication we can rewrite all these i j's and k's here sorry I'm just having to go off the screen here I just do a line this uh, this bit means it's got one and then no imaginary part that's no scalar, and then you've got the only I component there. That's J component. And that's the K component. That's another way of writing it in, in this form. However, as I did, I represented these as an, an ordered pair to begin with. So let's rewrite this multiplication out, yeah? And do it like this. So SA times VB times by, sorry, SB, oh, that should be an A, not VB, oh, that's A, that's B, well, if we do it just keeping as these vectors, we've got an SA times an SB, yep, we've got an S, um, A times a VB, plus um, an SB times a VA, doesn't really matter, I'm just going to keep scales together, and then what we've got is a VA times by a VB. We've got a cross product, yeah, but then we've gone, it's gone a little weird. We need to, it's not just the cross product, it's actually, it's VA minus, uh, dot product with VB. And some people may have noticed where this identity comes from, but I'm not going to explain that today. That's, you can prove it by just expanding these out. It's a bit too long and rigorous. But yes, that's what we're going to do. So if you rewrite this, this Q times A could be also written as A, S, B, minus V, A, dot product with V, B. And then the vector part can be written as S, A, V, B, plus S, B, V, A, plus the cross product, V, B. Yep. <sighs> so that's another way of writing uh, doing multiplication with quaternions. Now we're going to go on and talk about different types of quaternions you can have. So what we have are real quaternions. If it just if it actually joined up my handwriting for me. Um, so a real quaternion means it has no imaginary part. It has no um, vector part to it. So a real quaternion. Oh, I have a little words would have that and then there's nothing in the um, vector part, so it's a zero vector. So this is called a real quaternion. So if you had um, two real quaternions multiplied together, so SA times SB, this is actually the same as multiplying two scalars together. So this would be SA, SB, 
zero. There's no, there's a zero vector. That's called what a real quaternion is. And again, this is very simple to two complex numbers where they'd have no imaginary number, yeah? Um, so that's another way of calling it real quaternion. And then the other type of quaternion you can have, so I'm going to just actually put it to the side here, actually. What you've got is a pure quaternion, as it's called, a pure um, quaternion, where it only has the imaginary parts. So it has no scalar but it only has an at the vector part. I'm just going to put a squiggly line around here so it's a bit easy to read. So what we have is QA times QB would be 0 VA times by uh, 0 VB. And then when we expand that, we've got no scalar components. So this would actually just become VA dot product with VB. And then you've got VA cross product with VB. So when you multiply two pure quaternions together, you do get the scalar component coming back out, and you get the vector component. So that's what we call a pure quaternion. Um, other types of things you can do is like if you want to multiply by a scalar, so um, multiplying a square, a scalar, uh, just a scalar uh, multiplication, multiplication. Um, what we can do is if you have Q, which again is equal to SV, I'm just doing that again, scalar and vector. If you had um, scalar, we'll say lambda might be a good idea because I'm just thinking of eigenvalues and stuff there now. Um, you can say lambda hat and it has zero vector in there. Uh, this underline just means it's a vector, if again, if you can explain that. So we've got is QV. So it's exactly the same as me writing uh, lambda zero s v lambda which is the same as me writing uh, lambda s lambda v that's how so scalar multiplication works that's okay so now we get on to talk about the unit quaternion the unit quaternion now given some random arbitrary vector v, um, we can express this vector as both its scalar magnitude and its direction, yeah? So v can represent as u, I'm going to use u in this case, and then v hat. So where u is actually equal to its length, yeah, or its norm, or its magnitude, whatever, and v hat is its direction. So v hat actually has a magnitude of 1. So it's a normalized um, direction. This is again with the i, j, and k, they have their unit vectors. So if you had a pure quaternion, a pure quaternion could be expressed as q, I'm just going to go back into the white text now, uh, q equals um, naught v. Yes, yeah, a pure quaternion, as we learnt uh, then. Yeah? Uh, pure quaternion is that. So we could also express this as, again, in the unit quaternion notation. So we go naught u v hat, oops, like so. And then we get this to be put out. So we get q equals um, u naught v hat, which can also be rewritten. So this means we have a unit quaternion. So this is an arbitrary quaternion, which equals u hat, q hat, which is unit, must equal um, naught v hat. So the q hat means it's our unit quaternion. So if we added a scalar back into this, yeah, therefore if we had um, a normal quaternion, if we said q equals um, sv, another way of writing this would be q equals s plus u q hat. That's another way of writing it. So you use the length, and then we've got q hat. So it's just another way of writing another number. And this is actually very useful when we get to um, doing back and doing more complex stuff. So ooh, let's zooming out. Let's go back into that, yeah. yeah da, da, da. So let's talk about the uh, quaternion conjugate. Qua so just like 
complex numbers, we have uh, conju quaternions have complex num uh, complex conjugates or whatever they're called. So if we had Q equals um, S V, its complex conjugate, which I'm going to say star, is actually just the same as the negation of its imaginary part or its um, pure part. That's what it is. So when we multiply q by q um, star, you can guess we're going to get the square of its magnitude. So if we get da da, is what we're going to get is s um, times v dot times by s times negative v. So what we get s squared minus v dot minus v. And then what we get is um, S V minus S V plus um, V cross V. Yeah? So these minuses just become S squared plus V dot V dot. Yeah? And those cancel out. And cross product of itself is always zero because two vectors uh, perpendicular, you can't do it, it's, it doesn't work. These are identical. So this becomes zero. And again, as before, v dot is the magnitude squared, so what we've got here is s squared plus u squared oops, u squared equals zero. So what we have done is done the same thing as the quaternions and complex numbers, sorry, is that in complex numbers the magnitude of z is actually equal to the square root of z z star which is equal to let's say a squared plus b squared that's some lazy handwriting right there. We can do the same with quaternions. Where it's, I'm just going to write z equals a plus ib. Quaternions are the same. So if we've got q equals that s v. Um, q is actually the same as writing the square root of q q star. Which is the same as me writing s squared plus u squared or or the other way of writing would be s squared plus um, v dot v, like so. Yeah, that's one way of writing it. So now we have just found that the complex conjugate multiplier by itself will give us the square magnitude. And again, this means we can now normalize a, a complex, well, a quaternion. So quaternion. Quaternion uh, normalization. So, like a um, vector or a complex number, um, if its magnitude equals one, that means it's normalized, it has no magnitude. So, to normalize a quaternion, let's say q, what we do is q, let's say pr um, q prime, I'm going to call this, is actually equal to q over q line, yeah? So, this is what we'll do, yeah? And uh, we could also re represent that as q over the square root of s squared plus u squared. Yeah? And that will be our q prime will be our normalized quaternion. So let's give an example. Yeah, let's give an example. So example purple. So let's say q. And then what we've got is um, 1. Um, when we've got minus 4i uh, plus... 4j um, minus 4k. I'm just, I'm just, I know what the answer is going to be to this. This is why it's an example. So if we get the um, the length or the magnitude of q, what we get is we're going to square all these together. So we've got one squared plus the dot product, which is all that squared. So four four squared plus four squared plus four squared. You can see where this is going, don't you? Um, because these negatives, when the if I just put negatives in there, just to show it, the negatives just become squared anyway. This means we've now got the square root of 49, which is 7. Yeah, that's perfect. Again, some people say, what, is there also a negative 7? Yeah, I know, I know, but it's not the same. So this means to get Q prime, let's go back um, to that. This now means, in the example, Q prime is equal to Q over Q 
my hand, my modulus, which is equal to um, uh, 1 minus 4i plus 4j minus 4k all over 7, which can be rewritten as 1 over 7 minus 4 over 7i plus 4 over 7j minus 4 over 7k. Again, very simple. It looks like that. Now, how do we do division? Something called the inverse quaternion. So quaternion inverse. And this is how we kind of do division and such. So the quaternion inverse, as you might be able to guess, is actually denoted as its quaternion, its, its conjugate over its length squared. That's what its inverse is defined as. And what the inverse means is that q times by q inverse is defined to be as 1. So it's 1 with 0, which is 1. Now you can see this because when you do q times q star, what you get is that. So that's where this mini, like mini proof comes from. You just divide all that by that and you get 1. Yeah? So that's where the proof comes from. And if this is, if the quaternion, so if, and I'm doing this in big bold letters like that, this equals 1, I'm just going to do this where the inverse actually equals its conjugate. And that's really important. And the reason for that is that we're going to be only in computing, we're only going to be using um, unit quaternions to simplify everything because finding the inverse can be costly because you've got to divide by its, um, its length magnitude squared. So keeping everything unit it makes everything much simpler. So let's go on to different types of multiplication with quaternions. So different types we can have again is the dot product. Now again it works exactly the same Oops. Uh, dot product. This works exactly the same as you'd expect with a vector. So the dot product of, let's say, q1 times dot product, we am going to do it big dot, times by q2. I'm going to do this in white again, it'll be easy to read. So q1 dot product with q2 is what you'd expect to be the dot product of a vector. So that's I'm using A's and B's, and now I'm going to 1's and 2's. I, I, I'm just changing my style all the time. It's brilliant. Uh, V2's like that. This is exactly what you'd expect it to be. It would be the dot products of both of them together. So it would be S times S1 times S2 plus V1 times V2 and the 0 in there. So what we've got here is the dot product is actually S1, S2 times the dot product between a V2. Yeah? So that's what the dot product is. And one use of the dot product is actually to compute the angular difference between the quaternions. So if you do the dot product between two of them, the angle between them, cosine theta, is actually equal to um, q1 dot q2 over the magnitude of q1 over the magnitude of q2. Um, you may think, where does this derive from? Well, this is the same kind of formula for other dot products, like in the same as vectors. So you're treating quaternions as vectors in this case with a dot product, and it still works. Again, if the quaternions are if um, q1 equals q2, which equals 1, if they're unit, um, unit normalised or unit magnitude quaternions, not unit quaternions, confu confusing um, notation here, but unit magna, uh, magna, magnitude quaternions, then this can be written as that, which is actually what we've just figured out at the above there. Oops, that's a big S. And again, if we wrote this out in full, we get S1, S2 plus x1, x2, plus x, no, no, sorry, plus y1, y2, plus z1, z2. 
So that is getting the dot products and the angles between. And as you can see, there's another thing there. And now, finally, we get on to do rotations. Finally, with quaternions. This is... Ugh. So, rotations um, with quaternions. This is probably the hard bit to understand. Now, if we had a two-dimensional, a complex number, so Z, we remember we expressed Z, and again, was like this. So this was a rotation in 2D. So this is a 2D, oops, 2D rotor, yeah? That's what we called it, yeah. And again, this is analogous to three-dimensional space. So we can say Q now. It actually wasn't that. It was actually that. We said that was a Q as well, didn't we, in the other notation? So it's Q, that's Q. We can rewrite this as cosine theta, as and then times by sine um, uh, v sine theta. Actually, just, I'm going to change it. I'm saying, yeah, keep it as v. Keep it as v for now. And let's, I'll change the notation a bit later. So this is another way. So it's again, it's analogous, akin to this. So this is a uh, 3D rotation. Yeah? So let's see if this theory holds. Okay, let's just test. And let's see, We um, let's say we're going to have new uh, quaternions. So it's going to do a test. So let's test this theory, see if it even works. So what we're going to do is I'm going to say, uh, we're going to make a new quaternion. We'll say it's, say it's P, yeah? And then I'm doing, changing all the colors all the time. Brilliant, why not? Let's say P, and then we've got a vector of P. Just keep it in there. And then we have a, um, a quaternion, which is unit magnitude quaternion. And let's say that is, uh, let's keep it as this. So Q here is our scalar. Um, so scalar times some scalar value, so of the vec vector here. Yeah? Say U here to make a difference. So that is it. So what we're going to say is now that p prime, so once this has been affected by that, equals qp. And remember before, the q, the op, the like the rotation must be operate on the p, so it must come before. Because again, with matrices, as we did with um, 2D, that's how it works. That's one way of doing it. Uh-huh. Um, we're going to expand this out, so we've got s, there's your s, um, delta like that, multiplied by a pure quaternion. So then this can get expanded out to um, that uh, v hat dot p, so that's the real part, times by um, s p um, plus the scalar v cross product with p. So that's what we're doing there. That's how we um, expand it out. And you'll see this is, again, the general equation for a quaternion with both scalar and vector parts. Yeah? So let's consider the special, the special case where P, let's exp where P, so if P, so special case, special case, where um, P is perpendicular to V. That's the sign for perpendicular, so they're at right angles, they're normal to each other. So that means that, um, this that therefore means that negative V that dot P, that means the perpendicular must equal zero. Yeah? So it leaves us with P prime actually equals to zero, plus that s p plus lambda v prime cross product with p. Yeah? So in this case, um, v hat, this v carrot v hat, we can now just substitute s and the um, lambda to be sine, a cosine and sine respectively. So now this can now be rewritten as p prime now equals uh, zero, cosine theta p, p plus sine theta 
v hat cross by p. Yeah, that's one way of writing it. And let's say as an example, let's rotate by p by 45 degrees. Yeah, about the um, z axis. So, so what I'm going to do is uh, rotate. So what we've got is there's pure quaternion, yeah? And then I'm going to rotate um, P, yeah, by 45 degrees around, uh, let's say, the z-axis for now. Yeah, it'll be easy enough. So if you're thinking on the screen, X, Y, Z, Z's coming out, yeah? So make it same as 2D, yeah? Analogous to 2D. So this means our rotation, and back to our thing, so Q in this case now equals uh, cosine theta, sine theta k because remember it's only in the k direction that's all we need to know in which direction it is if we put 45 degrees in there this means now k becomes root 2 over 2 or 1 over root 2 whichever you want to say over root 2 to k and it shouldn't really be an underscore there just it's just the unit vector in the k direction yeah okay so now let's take p and um, put the special case where we know that P is going to be perpendicular to K. So let's say P is actually equal to, let's say, uh, let's say I'm just going to do it, 2i. 2i is a good case, there's a 2's there, and I just thought, why not? So 2i. So now let's do go back down to our example. I'm going to change a different colour because this green's getting a bit bold. Let's go to yellow. So this means that P prime equals QP. Yeah, so let's multiply it by uh, root 2 by 2 of root 2 to um, k multiplied by 0 to i, yeah? That's what p is. It's perpendicular to k. Yeah, they're both perpendicular to each other. So when we multiply these out, remember, we're keeping them the 0, so it's perpendicular. And then going back to that equation here, so s and that all that a lot, so I'm going to expand that out. So what we get is a uh, 2i multiplied by root 2 over 2, so yeah, yeah, yeah plus 2 um, root 2 over 2k cross product with i, yeah, like that. Then, that means when we do this, this times that becomes uh, 2i, that cr k times i equals uh, j, so this now becomes uh, naught root 2i, root 2j. So that is a still a pure quaternion, and it's been rotated 45 degrees at about the k-axis, yeah? That's what we've done. And to prove that it works, we're going to say the magnitude is kept the same. So the magnitude of this is 2, so the magnitude of p prime must be 2. So let's say p prime, this must mean it's the square root of uh, root 2 squared, Oops, that should be a plus there, not a time bit. Plus root 2 squared plus a 0 squared. Which you find out, that's actually a 2. Which is what you've got for, you've got 2 plus 2 square root 2, which is 2, yeah. So this is exactly what you expect. So the rotation has not affected the magnitude or its scale, but it's only affected its orientation. So one way to visualise this, and I'm trying to do this the best I can, let's do those um, things again. Let's get the lines out. Let's get a graph. This is the, as we did before with the previous things. So what we have here is I. Oops, I need to get back into the brush. So I, there's the J, and that's the K. The initial point for P was um, here. So this was, um, I'm going to do that again in purple, because that's what we did in the previous thing. So we've got P, which is um, 0 to I. And then we've got Q, which um, is here. And, uh, well, ish. And actually, no, Q's not anywhere here, because it's got a scale apart, so we can't re-represent it. Q, I'm just going to write up here, is um, 2 over 2 over root 2 over to k. So that's what q is. So the rotation is we're rotated about this k axis. Mm -hmm. 
we rotated it counterclockwise by um, that's theta, sorry, theta, which equals 45 degrees. And we've gone counterclockwise, because that's what the conventions are. And we've gone to a new point, which is at, thinking about it, is across this thing. So we need, if we get a circle again, I'm going to draw a very bad circle, because it's not actually correct. This circle, keeping the length, it says so we've rotated by 45 degrees. That looks like 45 degrees, right? And the new point we rotated to here, let's go here, is P prime, where this is equal to uh, 0 root 2 i plus root 2 j. So that's what we've done. That's a nice visualization, and that's keeping it with pure quaternions. So let's um, now think of something which is not um, at r perpendicular or orthogonal or normal or at right angles to P. So many different words to explain that same concept. <sighs> um, what we can say, let's say, let's create a new vector, so a new direction. So if we specify that the vector part of the quaternion, so is V hat, and we're going to say, because it's a normal, it's a pure thing, blah, 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 blah. If that is normalized, it's going to say it's root 2 over 2i plus root 2 over 2k, uh, like so. And then we're going to keep p to be the same. p is going to be um, the same, don't worry. That means now that q must equal a cosine theta sine theta v hat. So this is unit. And then p must equal a 0 p. Yeah. Let's go back to our colours to explain, express everything. So this means that p prime must equal q p, which is a cosine theta a v sine theta multiplied by 0 p. And if we do express this out long, what we get is a negative sine theta v hat dot product with p equals uh, cosine theta p. As we did this before, we're just writing out again. Uh, v prime cross product with p. So we get. So now we're going, what we're going to substitute is going to substitute in that v hat, substitute in p, and we're going to substitute in theta to be 45 degrees. Same again, we're going to rotate by 45 degrees. So now this, this means p prime now equals... Um, so we've got 45 degrees of sine is root 2 over 2. That's why I've done it. Keep everything to be root 2. It's a bit simpler that time. That should be an I. Oops. I plus um, root 2 um, k times by um, 2i. Yeah, that's what it is. That's the real part. And now we do to the imaginary part. I need to go on a new line for that. It's a lot to write. And the imaginary part we've got is uh, root 2 over 2, it's the same as cosine, and um, then p will be 2i, plus by uh, root 2 over 2 of um, v, which is root 2 over 2i, plus root 2 over 2k, cross product with 2i. So that's a long way around. And we know this is, never, this is not going to be a pure quaternion, because this has now got a scalar part to it. And again, this hasn't been rotated, um, it's, it's not been rotated 45 degrees anymore. And, and we find out that the actual, the length has not, has not normally two anymore, it's been reduced to root three. And if we write this all out and figure it out, so what we've got is um, P prime, um, dot I, K dot I, the perpendicular, so that becomes I, so that becomes that. So we've got is that squared, so we've got 4 by 2 over 4 times by 2, so that's 2 over 4 times 2, which is 1, that's why in that part is there. And then multiplying this out, we'll find out that uh, 2i is kept the same, and that means we've got root 2i, plus um, i cross i is i, 0, because they're both the same, and then k cross i is j. So what we get is plus j at the end, because those cancel out. 
So now, to represent this um, rotation, so you get that, yeah? We can represent it on the diagram. I'm going to do green for the axes again. That's the I direction. That's J, oops, brush. That's the I direction. That's the J direction, and that's the K direction. Now, when we rotate this, it's not going to be the same. We rotated it by 45 degrees, but now we've also got another part into it. Okay, so if we get the original point on the x-axis, so this is where P was originally, yeah? It's where P equals um, 0 to I. When we rotate this by 45 degrees again, um, and then remembering where Q, I'll just put Q outside here, Q, Q was uh, root 2 over 2, and uh, times, uh, oh, just, where to put it, where to put it, here, Q equals, uh, I'm going to put root 2 on the outside now, because it's just, it's a scalar, so that's 1 uh, root 2 over 2i plus root 2 over 2j, and I'm doing that because, again, it's the, um, it's K, K, sorry, K. I'll just erase it, that would be easier. Uh, K. That's the um, version of Q. So when we're rotating to P prime now, P prime, um, what we've done is kind of rotated across this axis here. And then P prime has given us a new positions along that. I must do it in purple again. Let's do it in blue. No, purple, purple is the best thing I'm going to do with the angle there. And erase all that. This is still by 45 degrees. And then P prime will be here, but not exactly, because it's now got a real component. So P prime equals negative 1 root 2i uh, plus j. But don't worry, don't worry. That clever Sir William Hamilton, um, he didn't he didn't publish it, but actually that clever Sir William Hamilton recognised that if we um, post multiply the result of QP by the inverse of Q, we will still get a pure quaternion. So what we do is um, instead of doing all that, what we're going to get now is Q times by p by q prime, this is actually what the correct formula is. So where q prime, where it's been negated, right? And we're still keeping 45 degrees in there, so if we get said qp, that was what, negative 1 uh, root 2i plus j, multiplying it by its uh, conjugate, uh, inverse, sorry, actually it's inverse, not its conjugate, um, Get negative 1 root 2i plus j, multiply by um, q, whatever q is now. So it's actually um, 1 over 2 root 2 negative i negative k. Again, I, I know it's different how I've written up there, but that's just to keep it the same. So now we multiply this out, or get the half back out there. Negative root 2 minus uh, the dot product between them two. So they times them, times the dot product. And then what you do is do the rest. Do this. So what we got is um, i plus k plus uh, root 2 of a root 2 i plus j I'm um, doing the cross product in av already. I'm just handing out the cross product for us here. 2jk. Then which that equals 1 over 2. So we're at minus root 2 plus 2 plus i plus k plus 2i uh, plus 2j minus i. Um, plus root 2j, oops, that was a, what happened there, plus k, that's what we got, and then, whoa, simplify that, what we get is i plus root 2j plus k, 
and wow. Okay, it's now a pure quaternion. And just to prove that the, to prove it's worked, the modulus, well, the magnitude of p should equal that. So the p prime now equals, let's do this, 1 squared plus root 2 squared plus 1 squared actually equals root 4, oh, which equals 2, which is correct. Ah, we've done it, we've done it. And that is how you do rotations with quaternions. So let's draw a diagram to see how this actually, to visualise it, how to actually visualise it. So let's draw another diagram. So let's go back to um, P, two i. So where's p on this thing? P's on the i-axis. I need to write the i axis and there. So that's i. That's um, that brush. That's i, j, and that's k. Now we wanted to rota rotate this by um, uh, nice degrees, didn't we? It was five forty-five degrees. However, uh, where q was our rotation, the new the angle where we rotate by is actually in this direction. So this was the angle of rotation. We said it was um, 2i plus 2k, or something like that, yeah? Or half, no, I think it was a half i plus half, well, where is it? So what was actually q equal to? There. It was equal to a half i plus a half, no, it would be i plus k. It was, it was i plus k was what? It was half i plus half which is where the direction of q is. So q equaled um, uh, root 2 over 2, half i plus half k. So this was the angle of the rotation. And so that means we need to rotate around that way, don't we? Yeah? I want to rotate by 45 degrees. This was where p was. And that was the angle of rotation. And then p prime, as we found out, was a 1 was at 1 root 2k. So p prime was at uh, 1 root 2k. So it's somewhere around about here written, like a sphere. So if we just um, draw out the things, the axes, and do these in different colours, duh, 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 just to keep it so it looks the right. Keep it into like a box shape. And then let's try uh, that orange. So I'm just going to just do the volume to see where it is. So you can see where it is on the graph. It's a bit hard to visualize that way. When we rotated it, you can, well, you may not, you won't be able to see this probably easily, but what we've done is it's been rotated to P prime here, and it's been rotated by 90 degrees. However, we wanted 45 degrees. So, to co rotate correctly the P vector by an angle of theta, by an arbitrary axis, this arbitrary axis here, which is V hat, I think we said it was, yeah? We must consider half of that angle. We have to use, we have to use half that angle. So, this means that the rotation quaternion, so I'm gonna do this in big old orange text, so, it's, so now Q, actually equals cosine half theta oops, of sine half theta v hat. So that is the general form of a rotation quaternion. I know these ep this episode has been stupidly long. Um, I may have actually had to break this down um, into numerous videos, but I don't care. So that is the general form where we've got Everything expressed. So v is the angle, ro like the the um, axis we rotate by, and theta is the angle we rotate by. Um, it's easy enough. In the next video, um, I'm going to talk about interpolation and how we can um, move different things in 3D space. So this that one's going to be a very short video. It might be actually today as well. So stay tuned for that, and goodbye.